I'm probably my own biggest obstacle to finding my voice. I question myself a lot. I overthink things. That is a thing that I do. I will start something and I kind of have to, when I'm in the studio, I have this thing that I do where I listen to audiobooks because I can't be left alone with my thoughts to overthink what I am doing. What is up, Shape Nation? This is Nick Torres here. And on this episode of Shaping Your Pottery, I got to interview PJ Anderson. PJ makes some really incredible mecha sculptures and traditional themed pottery. In this episode, you will learn how PJ makes her mecha awesome sculptures. You'll also learn about her to how her time at art school really helped her with growing as an artist. You also learn about her times when she was traveling in Africa and learning pottery in Africa. And there's so much more in this episode, and I hope you guys enjoy it, because I know I did. I'll see you guys in there. PJ, hey, thanks for listening welcome to Shaping Your Pottery, Shaping Your and share with me, with what is something potters should be doing if, you if they want to discover see, have success how close in you are to actually discovering really your own unique voice stuff. with your pottery? Yeah, I put together a three, four question quiz. It's very short. Stuff and keep it pushing your take thirty seconds Absolutely. for you to take. Absolutely, Shape Nation. If keep you pushing your limits. Keep you making, keep making, keep making. That's how you see shapingyourpottery.com. I love that quiz. So tell me the story how he got started in shapingyourpottery.com, and it'll be right there at the top. I hope you guys enjoyed this episode, and I'll see you guys next time. We had to take a three D in order to graduate. Sculpture was at eight a.m. and ceramics was at eleven thirty. So that decided for me. 11.30 for the win. And then I really, really liked it. I ended up changing and doing a double major because of how much I really liked ceramics. So, yeah, it was literally because the other class was too early in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely love it. So you contribute your growth as an artist to art school. Can you tell me more about you attending art school? Sure. Um, some of the best friends I've ever made are my pottery friends, my art school friends. Some of the most influential teachers I've ever had have been art school teachers. Um, being able to be in that environment where you can take risks in a different way because you don't have to try and, you know, make a living off of it while you're in school. There's a much less expectation that you have to sell stuff while you're in school. You're perfectly fine just learning. When you are finished school, suddenly, like, well, what are you going to do with your six foot pot that you just made? Right? Like there's like these risks that you can take in art school that you can't really take anywhere else. Not without a lot of preparation anyways. Yeah. So how did this time at art school transform your own pottery and your own sculptures? Well, we would have to start with Grace Nickel, who was my hand building professor at the time. And Grace Nickel, we were doing a coiling project. A very first project we did was a coiling project, and she had told me that one of my pieces reminded her of Magdalene Odundo. And I was, oh, okay. So there's a black potter out there who's super famous, amazingly well known. So this is clearly the place where black potters can like, hang out. This is the place we can be. Because up until that point in any of my classes, uh, drawing or painting or anything, no one had ever mentioned a black artist to me before. So this was like this transformative moment. So what is something you learned from your time at art school that you still use today? So many things. I still use ugh, a lot of my glaze chemistry, my slip chemistry. I do a lot of mathing. I have a way of looking at things. I try to consider a lot, which is something that they really try to hit home with you when you're a student is like you want all the parts to be considered that is also one of the major flaws because <laughs> i still do have like horrible horrible phobias of things like canvas marks on pots that was instilled in school has no basis in reality but for some reason i cannot have a canvas mark on a pot what else is something that i use all the time pretty much my network i think is probably the best one my network of other potters and friends who are potters who can take a look at my work and go over it with me and tell me if I am absolutely doing something ridiculous, but if it's a good ridiculous or a bad ridiculous, because that's a good distinction to make. Also, if I'm on the right track, if they have suggestions, like just working in a vacuum is really hard to do, but having that network of people who understand your craft 
and understand some of the things that you're working towards and can give you really good feedback. Honest feedback is amazing. Probably the most important thing. I absolutely yeah. agree. Absolutely agree. Shaping Nation, the more you can surround yourself with other creatives and other potters, mm -hmm. the more your pottery is going to grow. I love yeah. that so much. So you mentioned not being able to have a canvas onto your own pottery. Oh, can you tell me more about that? Sure. This was one of the things that some of my undergrad teachers had mentioned, that it makes a piece look unconsidered, unfinished, like you just didn't bother to clean it or to smooth it out. And as I've been continuing with ceramics, I've tried to try to think about the accessibility of the media, of like the medium and how we separate people who went to art school versus people who worked in community centers and how like there's this huge gulf between like what is acceptable pottery and unacceptable pottery, what is good pottery and bad pottery. And I think it's terrible. I don't like that this gulf exists. You can make amazing pots and never have set foot on an art school. And there's a lot of things that they've instilled into my brain from academia that are really, really elitist. <laughs> and one of those things is canvas marks. There are a lot of situations where showing the material that you used while making actually can benefit a piece. It can be an amazing, an amazing addition. But because of this thing in my head, I cannot accept it. I, I, I am working really hard on that. There's a few of them. And it's really about whether we want to be able to have people outside of art school be able to really connect with the media. And having these absolutes, like no canvas marks, that really just makes sure that they can't participate in the same kind of way. So my canvas mark thing that I'm trying to work on there's a pop, there's a couple of them, but that one, that one's a hard one. That one's my hardest one. Absolutely agree. Shaping Nation, you don't have to be discouraged if you didn't go to art school and you're only doing pottery in the community studio. You could still make beautiful and wonderful Amazing. art. You don't need art school for mm -hmm. that. I love that so much. Let's talk about your pottery. In one sentence, can you tell me what you make? I make vessel inspired forms that are informed by the traditional cultures from which I come. Perfect one sentence, I love that. So tell me a story how you started making the pottery and the sculptures that you make today. Well, the pottery is fairly simple. I really wanted to learn a lot more about indigenous ceramics. My mother is, and I am, Métis people. That's a mix between European and indigenous. We're a recognized ethnicity in Canada. Um, and we have our very own well, I'm a member of the Métis Nation, and my father is from the Caribbean, Jamaica. So both of these peoples have a really strong uh, tradition with ceramics. And I really wanted to find out more about the ceramics of the people I come from. I mean, everybody else in my class was learning about the ceramics from where they came from, like English, German, Spanish, like we learned all about that. But nobody wanted to talk about African ceramics or... North American ceramics or South American ceramics or, you know, South Indian ceramics. They were very specific about the kinds of things that they would talk about. And so in order for me to learn more about the works of the people that I came from, I actually had to do a minor in anthropology. I had to go and take like history of the New World people or prehistory of the New World or art of sub-Saharan Africa in order to be able to look at the work that they were making and try and be informed by that, which led to me actually being a research assistant for an archaeologist who was studying Zulu pottery in South Africa. So he brought me over there and I got my first chance to work with traditional practitioners. So they were teaching me the same way they would teach like a daughter-in-law or a member of the family. And I felt that there was this really strong connection that I was missing from school, like this intergenerational passing of knowledge that was happening. And we don't, we don't do that the same way in academia. And I found that this was probably the most important form of learning that I could get. So that's what I really clung to is this idea that this was unbroken traditional knowledge being passed down. And I was a part of it. So now I could go back home to the center of Canada and make work with African diaspora children and be able to say, look, this is how your ancestors made pottery. Like, 
this right here. This is a way. And now you know, and you can teach your children and keep it going. I wanted really strongly to do the same thing for Indigenous pottery, but we don't have any traditional Indigenous practitioners left here, just sort of didn't make it through colonization. And so I ended up doing getting grants and going and studying in New Mexico or in Southern Texas, like El Paso, and being able to do the thing where you work with the traditional practitioners from the beginning to the end, the harvesting of the clay, the grinding of the clay, doing the whole thing. And yeah, that is... That is, that, is, that is my whole shtick, as it were. So now tell me the story about how you started making the sculptures that you made. The sculptures. When I was in, well, I guess always, I've always sort of tossed around the idea of making some sort of figurative sculpture or uh, some kind of weird weaponized parts. I really, really like these ideas of weaponization and I've kind of always tossed around figurative. But when I got into graduate school, my professor, Grace Nickel, again, was amazing, and I love her to pieces. She kept reminding me that I already knew how to make a really great quail pot. She, she's like, you already know how to do that. So what else are you going to do? And that, that threw me. That threw me. I was like, oh, damn. What else do I know how to do? That was my thing. I've spent like 10 years getting good at this one thing. Do I know how to do anything else? And that is pretty much the story of how I ended up doing all of these like giant mech armor robots and like figurative sculptures is because I was really trying to find something that I could do with coiling and that I could do with these traditional techniques that I've been spending so much time on and use it to do something that was a little different, something that was outside the concept of vessel, something that was outside the concept of what we think of as a vessel. So that is when I started really hitting hard the sculpture. Like I've had sculptural things before, but it wasn't until grad school where I really felt the freedom to like make a six and a half foot, 400 pound mech armor robot, for example. I wasn't going to do that in my basement. Wasn't going to happen. Yeah, I love the mech armor robots. They're so cool. And there's, the detail is amazing. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that later. But for now... You are inspired by a lot of things, but the two that I find most interesting are you are inspired by traditional cultural practices and Doctor Who. How have these things impacted the way you make your own pottery? Well, the Doctor Who, um, the science fiction and fantasy. I usually just toss Doctor Who in because Doctor Who is kind of popular, but also obscure at the same time. Like there's a big history behind it. So I'm just like, yeah, all of that science fiction, fantasy weirdness that Doctor Who is, I'm all about it. But it's not just Doctor Who. It's also like Star Trek, Star Wars, um, books, novels, stories, comics, magazines, all of these things which play with concepts of future and how societies work. All that is totally my wheelhouse. And then I mix that with ways of making that are very much inspired by traditional peoples. So one of my favorite things about doing my thesis for my graduate school was that I was using traditional pottery techniques that are ancient in order to have a conversation about the way we respond to the digital technology and how we exist in digital spaces. So I thought that was like a really fun, messed up kind of dichotomy there. <laughs> I'm using old stuff to talk about the future. And it was kind of cool. I, I love that so much. <laughs> that is so cool. So something I found interesting is that you have a wide themes with your sculptures, such as making mecha suits to more traditional sculptures and everything in between. Can you tell me more about this? Sure. I was really, really wrapped up in this concept of weaponizations for a while. Ways that we weaponize everyday things against whoever it is that we would expect to use it. Um, so I was making some weaponized pots that were like water vessels that were so elaborately weaponized with blades and knives coming off of them that it made them non-functional, absolutely unusable. So it was like about protecting something to the point when it's no longer able to exist in a real way. Then I was moving on to some of these claw form weaponizations. I was moving into weaponized weaponizations using things like guns, revolvers, not just knives. And then I started thinking more recently about cultural weaponizations, things that we weaponize against each other. Things like the red hat. There's really nothing wrong with a red hat, but if I'm walking by myself at night and I see somebody or a bunch of somebody is walking around with a red hat, I'm going to get nervous. 
or a black hoodie everywhere I go. Like if you have like a 13 year old boy wearing a hoodie with a hood up, that is a symbol to somebody that this is a dangerous person and they now have every right to destroy that person. So these are all social things that we've just sort of accepted when the actual item themselves is in no way threatening. Like there's nothing threatening about a hoodie, but somehow that is the symbol for all the things that we're afraid of in society. There's nothing scary about a hat, but somehow that red hat has made it all the things that are scary. So it's wrapped it all up in a neat little package. So those are some of the sculptural ideas that I've been working through for, well, up until grad school. I moved on to more traditional weaponizations like, you know, mech armor robot weapons. But for that time, that was really, really where my thought process was going. I love that. That was a great yeah. explanation of that. So now can you give me a simplified explanation of how you were able to sculpt your giant mech mechanical robot <laughs> sculptures. Um, very carefully, <laughs> very, very carefully. When I was at the university, we were in between gas kilns. So our old gas kilns were out. Our new ones had not been in there yet. So suddenly I have to figure out how to make my giant mech armor robots in pieces and then be able to fit them together afterwards. So I started with making the shoes. Then I made the legs to the hips and fired those and then I would build the waist part on top of the hips and shoes and then I built the chest and shoulders and then I built arms and then I built a head and each one of these pieces had to fit together after it was fired even though it was fired it changes size it was it was actually some some pretty impressive math work on my part I still can't believe I pulled it off because it was a gong show a gong show the whole time I'm like you know what be really amazing if I could just slide a giant sculpture into my gas kiln and be done, that would have been amazing and super simple. But no, I was in between kilns. So piecemeal, I made it in pieces. It took months. So when you are making the sculpt for the, each body part individually, mm. do you make like holes for the next body part so like it fits in or like how Pretty does much, that work? Yeah, so each piece has a register or a flange, I guess, inside that the next piece will sit on. Yeah, yeah, it's it's pretty precise. And you want to make sure that the shrinkage of the piece, so you have to make it ever so slightly larger so that the shrinkage will allow it to still fit on those registers or flanges, depending on what you learned. Yeah, so it was it was it was an adventure. I learned I learned many things about myself, stress anxiety, <laughs> coming up with ridiculous ideas. I, I learned that I'm a person who comes up with ridiculous things and then somehow does it. Yeah, yeah, I learned that. I learned that. Absolutely love it. Shaping Nation, if you have a ridiculous idea, maybe it's just out of this world, go and do that idea because you're going to find so much out about yourself and about your own pottery. Mm -hmm. I love that. So let's talk about discovering your voice. Can you tell me about the moment when you knew you were heading the right direction with your pottery? I don't know that I have. I know that I have been making things. I know that um, the last couple of years, people outside of my city have noticed that I've been doing it, so that's good. But I'm never really 100% sure if the things that I'm making are entirely what I want, or entirely what I want to say. I feel like there's so many different things that I want to talk about, and each series of work is like one part of a conversation. So I never really know if what I've done is the entirety of my voice or just a part of it. Yeah, so I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. It's not a great answer, but here so we are. <laughs> what, would, what would you say was your biggest obstacle when it came to helping you get closer to finding your voice? Probably me. I'm probably my own biggest obstacle to finding my voice. I question myself a lot. I overthink things. That is a thing that I do. I will start something and I kind of have to, when I'm in the studio, I have this thing that I do where I listen to audiobooks because I can't be left alone with my thoughts to overthink what I am doing. So I have to distract myself by listening to like the entirety of the Wheel of Time series or something like that, because I can't spend eight hours a day just going, I don't know, maybe this is a stupid idea. Eh, I don't know. Maybe we should just keep going. I don't know. Throw it out. Ah. 
So like, I really need to kind of stop myself from being overly critical at the wrong time, because like something that's unfinished, you can't tell if it's terrible, if it's unfinished, you can't tell until it's done. So you really have to push through all that second guessing, all of that, like, oh, I'm terrible at life or whatever it is that you're thinking about and get to the point where it's actually done. And then you can make a judgment call about its beauty or it, if it was successful or if it's doing what you wanted it to do. So it's a really big investment to make a whole thing from beginning to end, especially if it's burnished. Oh God, if it's burnished, oh, it's the worst. And then you actually finish the pot and you're like, well, that was terrible. Smash. But you can't tell <laughs> until you get to the end. Yeah. So that's, I am my own worst. I am my own worst obstacle. I definitely agree. Shape Nation, we are our own worst obstacles. If we get out of our own head and pursue the things that we are trying to pursue, but also make sure to give critical advice to ourselves, then we're going to go a lot further. I love that. So Outside of art school, you also contribute your growth as an artist to working with traditional practitioners. Can you tell me more about sure. this? Sure. I mentioned a little bit earlier that I found that there was a really strong connection between peoples. Um, so when I was in South Africa, I spent four, four months the first time I was there and five months the second time, I think. And I got to visit different, um, different groups within the Zulu area of South Africa. So I got to work with a lot of traditional potters and I didn't speak Zulu, still don't. The clicking is hard and they don't really speak all that much English. So the only thing that we had in common or our conversational topics was clay. Like that was it. So if they're processing clay, I understand where they're going because I understand processing clay. If they are, you know, making a pot, and they're doing certain things, then I understand why they're doing certain things because I would also do those things when making a pot. So there's like this universalness that comes with making pottery, like around the world, anywhere you go and you find a pottery person, that's your person. Like they're just your person. And it's beyond language, it's beyond culture, it's beyond everything. Pottery people are pottery people. And that connection is instant. And I, really liked that I could get that connection. Even though like, I'm not Zulu, I have nothing to do with the Zulu people, I probably, I'm not really sure. But, or even in the American Southwest, because you know, my people are from Manitoba, in Canada, we're not from the American Southwest, but pottery people are pottery people, right? Like we all have our very own language, that's just making. So yeah, I really, really like that connection. And I really, really like that I can teach somebody something that was taught to me in the same way so they can take that information as well and they can continue that cycle so these stories aren't going to be lost now because i know that i know it and i know that i teach it all the time so those people are also going to continue with those particular skills absolutely love it i definitely agree so what advice would you give to someone that is looking to discover their own unique voice with their pottery well, don't let things stop you. We didn't really have any indigenous pottery, anything where I was from. We didn't have a heck of a lot of African pottery stuff either until way, way later. And I really wanted to know, and I really needed to find a way to find that information out for myself. So I literally had to go to a different department. I literally traveled around the world. I went and got grants. I got... You know, I did all of this research so that I can find out the things that I wanted to know, even though the traditional avenues of academia didn't have what I wanted. I was able to circumvent, like sneaky around and get that information and get those skills that I wanted. So it's not always going to be a clear, you know, step one, step two, step three, step four, because there's probably going to be a lot of roadblocks in the like along the way. And you need to find a way to get around them to do the thing that you want to do. And that's probably the hardest and most the scariest, because once you leave the path, the path that, you know, most artists do, everything's a mystery. It's all up in the air. You have no idea what's going to happen, but you're getting the thing that you wanted, the thing that you needed to know, the thing that you wanted to try, the things that you wanted to discover. 
So sometimes leaving the path is the only way to stay on the path. Oh, look at me being weird and philosophical. Oh. <laughs> That is quotable right there. I love that. So as we are coming to a close here today, what is one thing you want to hammer home with my audience today? Don't stop making stuff. Don't stop making things. That's pretty much it. When you get undecided or you feel unsure about yourself, go in the studio, make something else. When you feel like everything's stressful and everything's hard and no one's listening to you, make louder. Yeah, Not talk louder, make louder. There it is right there. I'm so quotable today. Absolutely Look at agree. me. <laughs> Those are some great party words right there. PJ, it was so great chatting with you today. Where can my audience go and learn more? About at my website, PJ Anderson Ceramics. I'm also on the Insta at PJ Anderson Ceramics. So any of those ones, feel free. Email, talk. It'll be fun.